Welcome to the Thriving Farmer Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Kilpatrick. Our mission is to inspire, educate, and celebrate sustainable farming. We believe that you can build a profitable, sustainable farm that gives you true farm freedom. Join us as we talk to farmers, innovators, educators, and entrepreneurs to glean their top takeaways in business and life. Hey, Thriving Farmers, Michael Kilpatrick here with yet another episode of the Thriving Farmer podcast. And today my guest is Seth Schaefer, who is a farmer from Southeast Tennessee, where he and his family own and operate Red Clay Farm, a certified organic farm. Seth obtained his master's degree from Green Mountain College in Sustainable Food Systems. For the past seven years, he has taught the sustainable agricultural class at Southern Adventist University. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, so we were chatting right before we popped on is that I actually farmed about about seven or 10 minutes from Green Mountain College for about a decade. Um, so I'm surprised we didn't overlap, but I think it was just kind of, you know, the last couple of years of us farming, we weren't super involved with the school. Okay, okay, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a beautiful area up there. I, I went up, I, I did my master's online through the school. And so I went up there um, uh, to do a residency and it's it's a beautiful area yes and so when did you actually do the residency uh that would have been february of 2015 okay interesting yeah um so talk to me a little bit about how did you get interested in agriculture well i mean i've always been interested in agriculture um to give you a little bit of background uh, i was actually born in west palm beach florida okay uh so it's a fairly decent sized city down there. Yep. Um, I don't remember much about it. Um, yeah. We moved, we moved from there, I think when I was like three or four up to Tennessee. Yeah. Um, so uh, my, my earliest memories uh, from down there are literally either playing on the beach or playing in a sandbox. Mm. And I always had a little toy tractor. Yeah. Uh, and I was quote, quote, farming in the sand. Um, driving it around. And I always told my parents from a very young age, I'm going to be a farmer. Mm-hmm. Uh, at that point, we're city people. You know, we, we know nothing about agriculture. Um, and our understanding of farming is 10,000 acres in the Midwest yeah. uh, growing corn, soy, or wheat, you know, and that's like, no, we don't have the money to buy the equipment, let alone all that land and infrastructure, mm-hmm. et cetera. Mm-hmm. Um, so we moved up to Tennessee and we, we got a little, little apartment that had a, a little bit of space for a garden. And so we started gardening and uh, each time we moved, we kept getting a little more land with, mm-hmm. with the, either the apartment or the house that we moved to. Uh, and finally we, we had a two acre yard, if you will, if you want to call that with a, a decent sized garden, um, always more zucchini and summer squash than we could deal with in the summer. Yes. Um, and at that point, I think I was like 10 or 11 and I was like, okay, guys, I want horses. Yeah. Well, you can't really put horses on a couple of acres when you've already dedicated some of it to a garden area and Mm -hmm. and everything else. So it wasn't practical where we were. So we started looking for land, uh, or a farm somewhere in the area uh, around us. And uh, so one day we're, we're just driving along and uh, we were actually heading to see a different property and we pass our current farm uh, and it's, it's all overgrown. It just has a for sale sign out front. Um, and so we, we inquired about it and uh, it was part of a, a larger operation that had been sold off over time. And this was the last bit of the farm, the original farm from way back in the fifties or sixties. Yeah. Um, and so we we got it it was uh 20 24 acres i think uh and so got it all cleared and just started the process of building a farm from scratch and not really knowing much about the process yeah yeah so what were some of the things in the early days that you felt like you really had to learn oh man everything and anything um I mean, so, okay, so we have the land. Uh, at this point, we already had a couple of horses. We were boarding at a friend's place uh, until we got our place uh, established. So uh, after the property was cleared, we put up one perimeter fence uh, and then immediately started to work on building a barn. Uh, okay. My dad, uh, he was a contractor uh, builder for, for many years. And so um, he had the building experience necessary to be able to mock up the plans, purchase the right um, 
the right tools, the right building equipment. You know, so we we put the barn up basically by ourselves. Uh, we got a few friends and and uh, one neighbor uh, that was uh, very helpful in bringing over his tractor to help us get the rafters up onto the yeah. barn. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it, it was learning how to, you know, how do you put fencing up? How do you build a barn? How do you, um, how do you take care of animals? Uh, yeah. You know, I'd been around horses a little bit before that, but this was all very brand new to us. And then we started plans for building a house, uh, which dad was the contractor for that, the house building, getting a road, uh, put into the farm, you know, just all, all these different things that take place. And in the middle of all that, okay, so we're going to have a little garden again. Um, yeah, because that's all we could do at the time. You know, we were stretched very thin with all the other projects going on. Uh, and then once once we got established onto the farm, uh, it was like, well, okay, so we have horses. Um, and, and this is kind of funny. Uh, Mom wanted uh, some Jacob sheep. Okay. Um, and specifically because Jacob sheep, they're an ancient variety of sheep. Yep. And they are more hardy. They're smaller, smaller build, so more easy to handle, especially if, if, if you're a female well, with a relatively youngish child, a teenage child yep. um, around. So uh, dad was working off the farm. Uh, and so it was mostly mom and me taking care of the animals um, and, and doing a lot of a lot of the stuff on, on site. And so we got the Jacob sheep along with the horses. And it's like, well, you know, there's a lot of coyotes out here. Uh, and we need something to protect the sheep mm, uh, the horses yeah. we know they're going to be fine and so we started looking around it's like well you can get a guard donkey it's like uh, i mean a donkey's fine you know nothing against those we have horses um oh what about a guard llama okay completely new concept to us yep yep so we, we started doing our, our research google books articles you name it i mean a lot of home research went into the entire process of the farm uh, and during this process, we found out that there is a uh, rescue association, the Southeast Llama Rescue Association, I believe is the name of it. And uh, so we got in touch with them uh, and with contacts and different things, we got our first two guard llamas. It's like, hey, this is, this is really cool. Yeah. We never expected to have llamas. Um, so a little bit of a learning curve there, you know, just learning about the animals. Uh, and then mom's like, man, it'd be really cool to have alpacas. So okay. again, we start, we start the process of, of learning about alpacas because when we first started looking at like alpacas are very expensive animals. Mm -hmm. um, then we begin to realize, well, if you get males, they're not as expensive. It's the females that drive the cost up. Yes. And so uh, again, working with the rescue association, they put us in touch with a farm that was dispersing their herd. And so I think we got like 15, 17 alpacas. Uh, Oh my goodness, that, that, was a huge, that was a huge learning curve. These animals were supposed to be tamed and very docile. They were anything but that. Yeah. Um, so that was, for me, growing up, uh, you know, going into my teenage years, uh, that was, oh my goodness, that was a huge adventure. Um, and so we just kept building the farm. We added chickens and goats, um, angora goats, uh, cashmere goats. Uh, and over time, you know, some of the animals we've decided to stop yeah. raising them on the farm and, and different things so that has fluctuated over time uh and once it was almost like once we got the animal side of the farm where we wanted it to be it was like okay we still have this small garden just for us uh but we have all this land that's yeah. relatively flat why don't we expand what we're doing with the garden why don't we become a produce operation and so you know we had we had some good friends um uh, down the road from us, they've been gardening uh, for years um, at a much larger scale than we have. Mm -hmm. And so I was kind of like at that at that same time, we were both kind of like, well, you know, let's let's start checking out, you know, farmers markets in the areas, just see what's what's out there. And so, uh, you know, we started checking out the the farmers markets in Cleveland, Tennessee, uh, and uh, kind of kind of depressing. They were yeah small reseller focused markets it's like no this this is not what we're looking for you know we've read about the farmers markets in new york atlanta yeah know, these big cities where it's real farmers actually selling you the produce that they grew we just started expanding the farm and uh we started going to the chattanooga market uh in 2013 i believe that was our first year okay 
it's, it's the biggest farmer's market in the Chattanooga area. Um, and for us, it was a huge market. Uh, we had one tiny little table uh, with, with produce yeah. on it. And uh, around that same time period, you know, I'm, I've, I've graduated, um, I've graduated college and I took one sustainable agriculture class my senior year of college. It's the only class that, that uh, Southern Adventist University offers uh, for agriculture. And that, that just opened my eyes like, wow, you can actually get an education in agriculture, not just yeah. practical hands-on that you get on the farm, but actual potentially like with a, with a graduation certificate. Uh, and so I, at that point, I was actually on track to become a veterinarian. Um, that's what I had. I'd done all the core classes for that undergrad. And I was like, I really don't want to spend another four years uh, doing science classes and in college and whatnot. I'm, I'm ready to be done with this. Yeah. This part of my life. You know, I live on a farm. I want to be a farmer. So I started Googling, you know, online master's degrees in sustainable agriculture. And I stumbled across Green Mountain College. Yeah. Uh, one of the best Google searches I've ever done. Uh, yeah. So I... I, I applied, I got accepted, I did the master's. And during this time period, we're like, we, we kind of had a, a family meeting. And it's like, well, you know, do we actually want to become farmers? Or do we just want this to be a yeah. side hobby fun thing? And I was like, no, we, we, we want to do this. You know, we really want to get into the, the whole meat and potatoes uh, side of the business. And so it's like, okay, so it's going to be a family endeavor. We're all on board. And so that was, that was really our, our launching pad uh, to continue doing agriculture at a, at a larger scale than we'd ever done before. Yeah. So what does the current farm setup look like mixed between the animals and the, and the vegetable side of things? And also, because you do field crops, so that's a side of it as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, every, every aspect of the farm has kind of grown. Like, you know, we started with the animals and we added the vegetables at a larger scale than what we've been doing. And as, as we're doing the vegetables, um, it's like, okay, so we have vegetables, but what are, what are other aspects of the farm that we can, we can grow on and improve? Well, we kind of stumbled into chickens for egg production, just because we found a chicken by the side of the road that came off a chicken truck. And so we brought okay. her home, cleaned her up, uh, and lo and behold, she started to bruise eggs. Like, oh, wow, okay. Um, thought you needed a rooster for that, but okay, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, again, very, very beginner level stuff here. And so we started to get chickens. And so that was an added side of the business. Uh, once they started to produce eggs, we don't do any meat uh, processing or, or any meat animals on the farm. And so we, we added the egg production in, in addition to having the fiber animals and the vegetables. And then uh, dad was doing uh, some reading online. It's like, oh, microgreens, what's that? And so we, he did a bunch of research on that. And so we added microgreens to the, to the operation. And uh, then a few years later, you know, again, just looking and seeing what type of diversity can we bring to the farm? Uh, we started, actually, we went up to uh, Kentucky. Um, I believe it was Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, and I, was, I was there for a conference and my parents were just tourists. Uh, in the city taking in the sites and they went into yeah. a, a pizza restaurant and the guy was talking they ended up talking with the owner and uh, the owner was like yeah you know I've got a, a stone mill and I, I mill the grains for you know making my pizza dough and, and other breads and whatnot it's like oh okay so we started doing research on on grain milling and, and mills and, and whatnot and so we actually um we found a company that made stone mills uh, and so we were in conversations with them. We wanted to purchase one of their mills, but this company is in Austria and neither they or we could find a shipper who would take one of their mills and bring it into the country for us uh, because uh, we were or still are a sole proprietor for our business. We're not an LLC or anything like that. Okay. Uh, and so nobody would, nobody would deal with that side of, I guess, the legality of it for bringing a million through customs. So like, well, let's, let's look on eBay, you know, see, yeah. see if there's anything on there. We found a mill, almost brand spanking new um, uh, out in Washington state. The owner, um, he had sold his restaurant bakery business uh -huh. and the people that bought it just wanted to keep the restaurant. And so the mill had only been used, I think for like three to five months. And that was, it. Oh, so wow. it was yeah. very good condition. So we talked to him and he's like, you know, it's already in the U S it's already configured for our, our electrical yeah. power outlets here. Um, so 
we worked out a deal with him. The mill got shipped over. We, we got it installed in, in our house. Uh, and so we just, at that point, we know nothing about growing grains. Yeah. Um, just, just like with every other step along this way, this is all brand new, another, another facet to the farm. So, uh, you know, we have the mill. And so we, we just start experimenting for our own home use, uh, running different kinds of, of corn, uh, some wheat. Uh, and then we're like, hey, you know, we've got this mill. You know, our purpose was to sell milled products. So we start, you know, purchasing uh, certified organic grains because our operation is certified organic with the vegetable uh, side of things. And so uh, we, we started advertising, hey, we have cornmeal, we have grits, uh, and I believe uh, we have a soft red wheat flour. Um, and I think we added a, a pumpernickel rye flour as well. And so that was just how we started, you know, four, three or four very simple uh, grain products that we could run through the mill. Uh, and it was amazing the, the response because um, nobody else in this area sells milled products uh, mm -hmm. at any of the markets. Uh, and so that was a niche that we were able to fill and especially, you know, around the holidays uh, and just other times of the year. I mean, the, the response to the milled products was just overwhelming. And so uh, we were like, okay, so what other milled products can we, can we add to our lineup? And, you know, what does it take to actually grow grains? Obviously we've grown corn uh, for ourselves on our, on our vegetable side of things. The coons usually get to it. Uh, uh, what's, what's it like growing field corn, dent corn for actually milling? And so uh, we've, we've started growing uh, some of the corn uh, that, that we need uh, for the mill. Uh, I've also grown popcorn uh, as an added side uh, to our farm. Um, we are currently working at starting to grow more of the cereal grains. Mm -hmm. uh, we tried growing a soft red wheat uh, last year and the weeds took over and, and that was a total flop. Okay. <laughs> so we, we just turned that field into a hay, hay field again. And so we're looking uh, at this, uh, this, this fall uh, going ahead and, and trying, trying to grow some more wheat um, and, and expanding in that, that side of things. Um, but again, it's, it's all a learning experience. Uh, so the corn has been our, our, best, our best experience growing grains for the mill. Yeah. Um, so yeah. And talk to us through a little bit of the the um, the culinary or the the production side. Like, how how are you growing the grains? Is it um, are you using a tractor cultivation or I, I, what kind? Of, how does that all work? Okay. All right. Yeah. So <laughs> so it it's taken a number of different forms. We have we have planted about an acre to two acres of of these grains. You don't need huge amounts of space. Okay. To grow any of these grains, whether they're cereal grains or corn, to be able to get a decent yield uh -huh. um, for for the mill, uh, for your end product of, of the different milled products. Um, so we have done everything from getting a push seeder. I'm, I'm forgetting the, an earthway, like an earthway, yep. Uh -huh. yep, and and planting an acre or two acres uh, by hand, uh, simply because we didn't have any tractor powered implements, you know, to do yeah. this planting. Um, I have since uh, purchased a John Deere 7,000 two row mm -hmm. seeder. Um, it works great for the corn, um, the sorghum, uh, the beans. Um, I, it's, it's multifaceted. That's what we look for. If we're going to purchase a piece of equipment, can it be used on multiple sides of our farm, not just for one purpose? Um, and that, that hugely helps with our labor um, just I would say labor costs just in our time of, of, mm -hmm. instead of having to walk this field we're driving a tractor across it cultivation that has been a little bit more of an issue um when when we started out you know we have a bcs um two-wheel tractor uh, and so i was tilling in between the corn rows um that can get very tiring very time consuming yeah uh, especially in the, in the middle of summer uh and so we've we've had more issues with that than i would like um, but we recently got our hands on a Tillmore cultivating tractor. Gotcha. So that is what I'm going to be using uh, this coming season uh, to cultivate our, our corn, uh, beans, and, and, mm -hmm. and uh, sorghum crops. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. I believe 
Uh, if I start early enough, that's going to take care of 90% of our weed problems right there. Yeah. And so what configuration do you have on the, that, that Tillmore? Are you using fingers, leaders? Or are you using just sweeps? Uh, it's, it's sweeps. It's, it's basically some wide plow shanks. Mm -hmm. um, I have, they're basically eight to 10 inches wide, I believe. And then I have some smaller sweeps that I can put on there that are like four to five inches wide, I believe at the base. Gotcha. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm just starting out with this. Um, I would, I wouldn't mind getting some fingers at some point, um, Yeah. but I'm, I'm going to use what I have because this is all coming with, it came with the tractor. Gotcha. Um, yeah. And so I'm, I'm going to try this out and see what works, what doesn't work. And the next year I'll be adapting and doing what I need to do at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Talk to me a little bit about the sor sorghum because that's another crop that's, it's, it's, it's a Southern crop and it's one that, you mm -hmm. know, I don't think a, lo a lot of people are, it's, there's not that much production happening. Right. No, sorghum was, it, it was like all the rage back in the, the 30s, the 40s, you know, mm -hmm. the 50s and 60s, um, but it, it has tapered down. A lot of people, when they hear sorghum, they're thinking grain sorghum. Milo is another word for it. Um, but the sorghum, uh, we did uh, about an acre, maybe a little over an acre this last year. Um, it was our first year doing it. Um, so we, we purchased a uh, Chattanooga 44 uh, mill for it. Mm -hmm. um, and so there, there's a lot of things we're going to be doing differently uh, this coming yeah. year, uh, but we have, we have a, uh, 1956, uh, Ford tractor that powers the, the press, the mill for it, uh, and growing sorghum. I mean, it's, it's basically like growing any other type of grain. Uh, I use the John Deere, uh, two row cedar. Uh, I, yep. I switch out the seed plates, put the, the Milo plates in there fill up the hoppers, uh, and then it's just driving across the field. It gets planted. Uh, you cultivate it. Uh, I'll be cultivating it with the Tillmore tractor. Uh, and then you just, you, you let it grow. Um, we didn't apply any fertilizers uh, to it. Um, and it, 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 it grew. I mean, I, I had, I, it did very well for us. Mm -hmm. um, obviously areas for improvement, um, harvesting it. Uh, we got a brush cutter, um, Basically, it looks like a souped up weed whacker. Okay. And we just went through the field and just were cutting the stalks off a um, few inches above the ground. We put it on all on a trailer, drove the trailer home, and then we just started running it through the mill. Um, we collected the juice for it. Uh, we have a pan uh, that we, we cook the, the juice down to sorghum syrup, uh, sorghum mm -hmm. molasses. Uh, and then we, we, bottled, we bottled it up. Um, we didn't realize quite how long it was going to take to cook all okay. that juice down. And so we started in the evening and I think it was like two in the morning by the time we finished bottling. Yeah. It's like, yeah, next time we're doing it during the day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So talk to me through a little, why did sorghum syrup fall out of favor? That is a good question. Um, and I'm, I'm not 100% sure. Um, I was talking with my grandpa uh, about it and he remembers growing up and going to the farmer's market and getting sorghum molasses, yeah. uh, getting uh, sorghum lollipops, you know, different things like that. Uh, and he was saying that he thinks it's because, you know, you, it, it's a lot of work to go from the sorghum plant to the sorghum molasses. Okay. You know, it's not like with, with maple syrup, you're just, you're tapping a tree, you're getting the syrup. And then you're boiling it down and yeah. you have the maple syrup right there. Um, it's, it's a more involved process. Um, and I think it, uh, this day and age, when you're thinking of the sweetener, you know, you think honey, you yeah. think maple syrup, sorghum, uh, what's, what's sorghum? And, and that's yeah. been our experience. When we go to the market, we, we don't have a ton of it. Uh, and so we, we put the bottles out and people are like, oh, is this honey? It's like, no, oh, this is so, you, so you have to yeah. educate the customers. Um, and so, yeah, I just think, you know, people just aren't as familiar with it. Now, the older people that come to the market, yeah, they see it it's like, oh, you've got sorghum. So they'll buy it, you know, and they're putting on their pancakes or whatever else. And, and they remember it. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I mm -hmm. think it's just, you know, as with anything else, you know, if, if something, you know, isn't as recognizable, isn't as prevalent in our society, uh, it kind of gets forgotten about. Yeah. If you will. 
Yeah. Yeah. I think you're, you nailed it too with the work. And obviously I think the rise in cane sugar production in Florida on massive mm-hmm. scale, obviously, you know, it made, it was cheaper to buy just white sugar and obviously corn syrup too, as they figured out you could make mm-hmm. corn syrup. And that mm-hmm. obviously was, you know, a much different, um, yeah. Um, and you actually on your, if you go to your Facebook page, you have a video of you guys pressing sorghum, right? Yes. Yes. All right. And that's uh, actually using a, uh, golf cart to run the mill. Mm -hmm, mm mm-hmm that's pretty cool (laughs) well right like end of summer right when everything is everything's cooking off you know Mm -hmm. we've got fall crops to get in we've got cover crops to get in uh all three of our tractors died um almost in in quick succession one after another and so uh we we shipped them off to a local uh track repair place and uh we are still waiting to get them back Uh uh-huh so yeah, uh, it was like, well, you know, we have we have the tractor we need to to run the mill, but it is non-operational. So we quickly were were we were again back to Google looking what can we use to run this mill. Yeah, um, and so we we got our golf cart and it's like, well, let's let's try it out. Um, it it works in a pinch. It obviously it worked for us. It's a slow. Um, it doesn't give as much power to the mill, so we had to run the cane slowly one yeah. or two at a time yeah yeah um with a tractor you can run you know a fistful at a time um you know and, and it, oh, yeah. it just goes much faster but you know in a pinch you do what you have to do yeah and now it's a cute uh, and cool video just to kind of see how that that works and i was like you know you see the mill first and you see that and then all of a sudden you see pan and it's like oh it's a golf cart <laughs> so yep, yep. yeah um, now also you do popcorn. Talk to us through, you got a, um, ag 101, like, um, infographic on about popcorn and what makes it pop and the two different types. Mm-hmm. Do you do snowflake or mushroom on your farm? Uh, it's mushroom. Okay. Yeah. I think it's a popcorn. superior popcorn. Yeah. I, you know, to be honest with, with the popcorn side of things, uh, I, I didn't really have a lot of knowledge beforehand. Um, okay. You know, I had some friends, um, again, our, our friends that, that live down the road from us, they've, they've grown popcorn for years, um, small batches, you know, blue, red, white. Um, and so I'd always gotten some from them and it was vastly superior to anything I would get at the store. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, well, why don't I just try growing popcorn? You know, what, what how hard can it be? Uh, my first time growing it, um, it was a very dry year. I didn't irrigate the corn. I didn't fertilize it. I had maybe 50 feet and I got 21 pounds off of, off of that, that 50 foot section. Um, gotcha. Very poor yield, but it, it tasted amazing. Um, I yeah. got, um, I'm forgetting the name of the corn right now, but it's, it's a hybrid from Johnny's uh, robust 997. Uh-huh. Yep. And so I was like, man, this is awesome. So I, I bought 25 pounds of seed the following year. And using using the tractor and the JD seeder, I, I planted four acres of it. And uh, we're all just kind of like, oh, wow, you know, the corn's growing, you know, I, I, it, this is awesome. And then the question comes to mind, okay, so how are you going to harvest all this corn? Uh, because you're talking four acres. You've never grown four acres of any yeah. type of crop. I was like, um, that's a good question. So we started looking, uh, we started looking around um, for harvesting equipment for, for, you know, corn type grains. And um, we actually found a international harvester 1440 combine. It's an older combine, smaller than probably most any other combine that you're going to find mm-hmm. in the modern day. Uh, it came with a corn head and a wheat head, uh, which was which was perfect for us because you know we're we're going to be growing the grains, uh, the the cereal grains. Yeah. And uh, so we we drove it home, um, and I was like, man, this this is going to make harvest so good. Uh, and then we couldn't get it into we couldn't get it out of of gear, um, and so oh, no. we're we're currently trying to work on that. So the combine is a, a very big, very pretty um yard ornament <laughs> yes yard ornament thank you uh, at, the, at the end of our driveway because when we got it home we're like okay so we're going to drive it up to the barn oh shoot yeah we've got a 12 foot gate it's a 15 foot uh head, corn head. it's not going to fit yeah um, so so that's where it's parked um and we're not we're not very mechanically inclined um so we have to find 
uh, we have to find mechanics and whatnot. So that is that is definitely on the list of, of projects. Uh, once we get our tractors back, that'll be the, mm -hmm. next, the next mechanical project we get into. So with those four acres of, of popcorn, um, that was me mostly picking it by hand. My family definitely helped. I got some volunteers. Yeah. Um, we got a, a couple of our farm workers to help pick it. Um, it was a big job, fun job. It's very easy to pick. Yeah. It's just four acres. It's a lot to do by hand. Yeah. Now with that, uh, that combine you got, that does, does that do ear corn or is that going to shell it as it runs through the machine? Uh, no, that, that is going to be shelling it. Yeah. Okay. We got it in mind to help us when we grow our dent corn for the mill. So we can already have it shelled and everything. And it works for popcorn as well. Gotcha. Uh, so okay. Very different. Yeah. Cause I know cause the only reason I ask is some people say popcorn is something you really want. They prefer to hand shell or use a different type of shelling machine. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's just some of the smaller shellers aren't quite good for it because you can't break it in any way because if you break it, it won't pop properly. So um, yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe it's just on smaller. Maybe someone can email in and correct me because, um, but yeah, anyway. Um, so, all right. So you're doing the popcorn, the sorghum, um, and then the vegetables. Now talk to me about selling of the grains. How do you typically, are you selling them, um, you know, like by the pound or is it by the half pound? How is someone typically purchase you know, like the grits or something? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So uh, most of our sales are at farmer's markets uh, or maybe to individuals. Okay. Uh, we also have some wholesale accounts uh, to some restaurants uh, um, or even just individuals that want to buy uh, larger amounts. So typically, uh, we started out selling grains in both one pound uh, bags and two pound bags. Um, we quickly decided to do away with the one pound bag. Okay. Um, because more people were gravitating because we would sell the, the one pound bag, uh, I believe it was for $3 and we'd sell the two pound bag for $5. And this was standard okay. across the board, whether it's uh, a cereal grain or a grits or, or a cornmeal. And so it's like, well, you know, we get better bang for our buck. They get better bang for our buck, you know, and it cuts out an extra, an extra bagging process, labeling yeah. process for us. Um, so yeah, we, we, we sell it in two pound bags and, and, you know, we tell people if, if you can't use two pounds all at once, put it in your refrigerator, put it in your freezer uh, for storage purposes. It's going to store that way for at least a year. Um, and, and people have come back to us um, and they're like, hey, you know, putting it in, in cold storage should work wonderfully for us. Um, so yeah, with, with the restaurants and whatnot, um, we usually will sell that in like five gallon bags um, and then just weigh it off as we're, as we're uh, packaging it for them. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll do, you know, 30 pounds, 10 pounds, maybe five pounds every couple of weeks. You know, mm -hmm. it just depends on, on what the restaurant wants or needs. Mm -hmm. And are, what are they, how are they selling it to their customers? Are they selling it as like a locally milled? Are they selling it as a specialty? How are they talking about that? Okay. So yeah. So like with, with the one restaurant that is our most frequent customer, uh, they are actually doing a, uh, I'm going to call it a house-made grits. Um, okay. Yeah. It's like the, it's the restaurant is a, a local bistro, mm -hmm. and so they will cook the grits uh, for up to or over an hour. Uh, just, mm. It's a very slow cook. So forget anything you've ever heard about instant grits or quick yeah quick cooking yep. grits from the store. Forget about it. Um, for us, we will cook the grits for about 45 minutes at home. Okay. Um, so it's something that you just you put like uh, one cup of grits. Um, to, I believe it's one cup of water yeah i think it's a it's I think it's a one-to-one -one. i don't i i guess i've done grits in the past but um, never that long but yeah mm -hmm. yeah and so that's that's how we do it that's how the restaurant does it um and we'll have customers come up to us at, at the different markets we go to uh, and they'll say hey i went to the bistro and i had your grits there you know they were they were listed on the menu that i talked mm -hmm. to the chef etc cetera, etc cetera. They were so good. I want to try that for myself, for my own home cooking. And you know, we get we get a lot of customers like that. Um, we get we get customers that you know maybe they lived in the area before and they've moved out of town. And typically, we do not ship our milled products simply because pre-pandemic it would double the cost of the milled product to ship them. Mm -hmm. um, but we'll have people that are like I don't care. I'll pay the shipping send me, send me your grits, send me your flour, whatever. I'll pay yeah. for it. I, I just, I want it. 
like it's like well okay you know we're not, we're not going to say no to that yeah yeah exactly if they're if they want it then let's make it happen yeah mm-hmm. so talk to me a little bit because you're also a you're an educator as well talk to us about that side yeah. of of uh, what you you focus on okay so I, you know, as I said before, you know, I got my master's from Green Mountain College. Uh, during this time period, um, I was working at Southern Adventist University. Um, I graduated with my undergraduate degree from there in history. And the history department, it, it's really funny. The history department is actually the department that houses the sustainable agriculture class. Okay. This, this class is intended for their international development majors. Um, the thought process behind it was, you know, if, if we're going to be preparing students to go work overseas for an NGO, for the government, et cetera, mm-hmm. um, yes, they need to know some policy. Yes, they need to know how to interact with people of a different culture, but they also need to know a little bit about how to grow their own food because there is no Walmart, there is no mm-hmm. Publix just down the road for yeah. them. And so uh, that's, that's the same class that I took my senior year. Uh, and so fast forward a couple of years past graduation, um, I'm, I'm getting ready to wrap up my master's and uh, my, my old professor uh, and her husband come to me. They were kind of co-teaching the class together. And they're like, look, Seth, uh, we, are, we are leaving uh, Southern. We are going to go overseas. Um, we feel you would be the perfect person to take over the farm and teach the agriculture class if you're interested. But it's, it's oh. a package deal. You have to do both. Yep. Uh, and I had been itching to get my hands into the, the educational teaching side of agriculture um, and, and running the campus farm. And mm-hmm. I, I immediately said, yes, there was, there was no thinking about it. And I was like, yes, sign me up. So, you know, you, you deal with the politics of red tape and, and waiting for the strings or the wheels to roll, you know, with, with any type of administration or anything. And so yeah. um, I took over the farm January of 2015, and I started teaching uh, that fall. The class is taught every fall semester. Uh, I teach twice a week, Monday and Wednesday afternoons. Uh, Mm -hmm. And with my class, I would term it as a hybrid. So one day a week, uh, we are in the classroom, and I am running my students through almost every facet that I can teach about sustainable agriculture in the classroom. So they're getting Mm -hmm. the theory of agriculture in there. Then on Wednesdays, we go out to the farm and they're putting the theory into practice. Okay. So we, we learned about seed starting. We've learned about food waste. Okay, so now we're here on the farm. How do we mitigate food waste on a farm? Mm-hmm. Um, what does it actually look like to start those seeds? Uh, what happens if I start it when it's too cold, when it's too hot? You know, it's all these different things that, that run into or, or put together, they, they make a farm run or not run, you know? So, you know, there's, there's definitely huge learning opportunities there. I bring in guest speakers um, from the local agriculture community, mm-hmm. you know, from the urban farm. Uh, I have a, a lawyer uh, that comes in uh, that was very heavily involved with urban agriculture. And so she talks to the, my students about urban agriculture uh, and different things like that. So it's, it's very immersive. Um, I bring in somebody from the NRCS to talk about soil science. Okay. Um, and, and I mean, teaching, teaching ag for me, it's, it's incredible. Just when you're, when you first start out teaching, you, you, you have a blank slate. Most of my students, they have zero background in agriculture. Um, every once in a while, I get some, some guys that, oh yeah, you know, grandpa and grandma, they have a farm. I, I grew up helping them on the farm. And so they know a little bit about farming. Um, but it's just, you, you start showing them what agriculture is, what it can be. And you see those light bulbs coming on. Uh-huh. And it's just like, oh my goodness, they're getting it. And then they start asking questions. And half the time I'll have a lecture prepared. I don't get through the lecture. You know, I'll get yeah. partway through and the questions and whatnot. And we just turn it into a, a big discussion right, right there. And we all just huddle up together and just start talking. And yeah. I feel that students get more out of that than my pre-planned lecture. Yeah, and I give them my PowerPoints. I, I post it onto our, our Moodle uh, for, the, for, the, for the campus there. And it's like, hey, you know, you want to see the lecture? By all means, here's my PowerPoint. Here's a recording of it. Um, on, on sometimes I'll record my lectures. Um, but, you know, let's, let's dive in. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
So what is, and so most of those people that take that, are they then just using this for home use? Um, or as you said, you know, if they're going to another company, country for just survival, or are they actually going on to farming? Uh, very, very few go on to farming. Uh, I get accounting majors, religion majors, science majors. I mean, you name it. I, I have almost had every major on campus come through, come through my class. Um, yes, some of them do go on. Uh, there's, they, they, they leave campus uh, and they will either go on and get a master's degree uh, in international development. Um, and so sometimes I'll hear back from them um, as they are either going overseas or just working with different NGOs or whatnot. Um, but the majority of them, uh, yes, it is for home use. I'll, I'll hear from my students a couple of years down the road, hey, I'm established in, in X town. Here's my raised bed. Here's my container garden. Uh, I'm having this problem or I'm thinking about doing this. What do you what do you suggest? And so I'm able to dialogue with them a little bit and stay in touch, you know, several years outside of the classroom. And that's that's really rewarding to see that, hey, they're remembering what yeah. they're taught. You know, they, I don't use textbooks for my class. Um, I use uh, I use books like uh, Elliot Coleman's Four Season Harvest, uh, mm -hmm. Fair Food uh, by Oren Hesterman um, and uh, Oh, I'm forgetting the name, Dan Barber's book. I'm forgetting the name yep. of that book. Mm -hmm. um, those are my textbooks. Uh, they're easy to read. They're easy to understand. Uh, and that's what I'm looking for. You know, a textbook can sometimes be very dense and heavy. And I want something that's easy to understand for my students. And, and they, they use these books years later. And that's, that's what I'm going for. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes sense. Hey, flower farmers. Did you enjoy our January flower summit? If so, head to farmsummits.com forward slash flower bonus to sign up for an exclusive new bonus flower summit day. We have seven new exciting presentations from farmers all across the U.S. talking about using dried flowers to extend your sales and reach new customers, connecting with your community through farm-based events, success with sunflowers, planting and harvesting cut flowers on a hundred acre farm, and growing sticks ornamental branches for the floral industry. So head on over to farmsummits.com forward slash flower bonus to sign up and learn all about this exciting new one day summit event. Share with us about kind of like the, the pull between the farm and the teaching. It sounds like your teaching is pretty like, um, it's locked in. So you kind of got a really good schedule on that, but do you ever have, you know, struggle with one or the other? Yes and no. Um, with with the teaching side of it, I only I teach one agriculture class a year, and that that only happens in the fall semester. Um, yeah, I really wish there was more uh, call for for teaching the class more semesters. Um, I would definitely be down for that. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, with with the teaching, I, I would say definitely at at this point in time, I've I've been teaching, I believe, for the past seven, six or seven years now. So I have the teaching aspect of it down pretty, pretty well, pretty well down pat. Um, you know, with, with the farming aspect of it, you know, with the college farm, uh, I run that farm year round um, with a, a team of student workers and sometimes an added volunteer that will pop up every now and again. Uh, mm -hmm. And so my goal with, with that farm in, in particular is I want my workers to be able to almost run it on their own. And so mm -hmm. every week um, I'm, I'm going through the farm, looking at the different facets of it. But like right now, yes, it's the beginning of February. We've been starting seeds like crazy for our spring crops, for our summer yeah. crops. Um, and so it's like, it's, it's taking the students and I, I have a brand new team this year. Um, and so it's taking them through and say, okay, so this is how we're gonna start the seeds. This is why we're starting the seeds now. Um, and this is how, how you go ahead and take care of them once they've been started um, in, in our high tunnel. And we just, we go through the season like that. And so by the end of one semester um, or one, one growing season, whatever that shape that may take, uh, I have my students trained in well enough so that they can, okay, I need to start seeds now. I need to be watering, I need to be transplanting. Uh, I need to probably fertilize this crop because it's looking a little bit nutrient deficient, et cetera, et cetera. And so I'm trying to give them as much of my farmer knowledge as I can. So that way 
they're self-reliant, self-sufficient. Yes, they may never run a farm on their own again. Yeah. Um, but they always have me as a, as a resource there. I'm on site multiple days um, out of the week. Uh, I do work uh, at the college library um, on, while I'm paying off my farm. Uh, I definitely need an outside, uh, outside source of income. And so uh, I, I'm in constant communication with, with my crew, you know, whether it's video, text, phone calls, on-site. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's how those two play out. And obviously I've got my own farm uh, outside of that. Um, but yeah, I, did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that, that, I think that balance and how do you maintain that? And yeah, that's, 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 that was good. That was good. Talk to us about the turmeric and ginger because I know that's something um, that you guys do. Um, and uh, I see that in the pictures on your Facebook page. Yes, yes. yes. So um, <laughs> turmeric and ginger. Um, so that's, that's always been uh, crops that we've, we've heard about. Um, we, we sell uh, a a chai spice and a golden milk. Um, okay. There's, uh, there's a bit of tumor. There's obviously a lot of turmeric in the, in the golden milk. Um, and so, you know, we, as usual, you know, we started doing this, uh, you know, and we've, we've been purchasing turmeric powder, um, you know, obviously from off the farm uh, yeah. to make the golden milk. And it's like, hey, you know, why don't, why don't we look into growing some of our own? You know, what, what yeah. does that process look like? You know, another learning curve. Uh, and so we, we started uh, checking it out. Um, I, I went to the Adventist Agricultural uh, Association's conference, I believe it was last year, uh, and they had a class on growing turmeric and ginger. Um, and I was like, well, shoot, this is easy. Uh, so yeah. um, sometimes with, with, uh, with grocery stores, they will get products uh, that they, they can't sell. You know, maybe yep. it's maybe it's already going bad, it's spoiled or whatnot. So I have I have a relationship with one grocery store that I get all their their produce scraps, and we use that as supplemental feed for our livestock. Mm -hmm. They they love it. We get it in these huge trash bags, and we just dump it over the fence, and they go crazy over over the scraps. Um, a lot of times, well, I shouldn't say a lot of times. At certain times of the year, they will throw out boxes or cases of ginger and turmeric. Oh my gosh. Um, because they, they have a little bit of mold on them and so they can't sell them. So the whole thing goes out. Yeah. Uh, and so I'm, I'm seeing this, you know, in, in the pile there, I'm like, well, it's free. Why don't I just try growing it? You know, I don't, yeah. I don't know if this stuff has been sprayed with a growth inhibitor, if it'll even grow, you know, I try it, you know, let's experiment. So we gathered up all we could find of that. And we, we stuck it in pots um, and, and we started growing it. And it, it takes a while for it to sprout, um, yeah. we almost we almost thought it was it was trash, and all of a sudden here comes the first little sprout, and, and this is weeks after we've after we've planted it. And yeah. Oh my goodness, it's growing. And so, uh, last year uh, we we had goodness we we had quite a quite a few pots. Um, I don't I don't remember how many we had, but we were we were able to put in, um, I believe it was one row of ginger about. 30, 40 feet long. And I believe it was three rows of turmeric that same distance. Um, and so we're, you know, it's a farm. Uh, for the most part, it's myself, my dad, and my mom um, that, yeah. are, that are running this place. Um, and we've recently started adding a little bit of help um, because things have just gotten to that point. Um, but with everything going on in the fall, we, we never got around to harvesting it. And we heard from different people that, well, you know, you're in Tennessee, it's zone seven, 7A or 7B, depending on who you ask. And they're like, well, yeah, it can survive a cold temperature, you know, that we get here in Tennessee. Mm, okay. Okay. What do we know? You know, we're, this is our first time trying it. And we left it in the ground. This spring, we, we, we went back out there and uh, uh, we started digging around looking for it. And there, there's all the, all the ginger, you know, it's, mm. it's all there. It's starting to come back. We couldn't find a lick of turmeric anywhere. Um, the, okay. The cold weather, it just, it, it, it froze. Yeah. It, we're guessing it rotted uh, and got eaten by the soil organisms. Okay, yay, we fed the soil. Not our intent, but oh well. Yeah. Um, so once again, you know, it was, it was going through those, those produce scrap bags. Uh, we found multiple 
uh, amounts of, of, of uh, turmeric. Um, and so we, we planted it again. It was, it was a super late planting. We actually got it into the ground. Um, I believe it was mid-May, mid-May or late May, one of the two. It was, it was later than we wanted to get it in. Um, but we're like, you know, it, for us, we're gonna be harvested in October. It is grown out, outdoors in the field. This is not in the tunnel. So let's just see what happens. It was a beautiful crop. Um, yeah. It, it, it was, it, it was just, it blew, it blew all of us away. And so, you know, come October, you know, we went out there and um, we, we didn't fertilize it. Uh, it was kind of one of those crops. We planted it, we weeded it like once, mm -hmm. and then we forgot about it the rest of the year because we yeah. were busy with other crops. Yeah. Um, and it was just, you know, for us, they weren't the hugest tubers you would ever find um, for the turmeric. Um, but it, it, it was decent, you know? Yeah. And so we, not knowing what our market would be, we would harvest a few plants at a time, take it to market. We would sell out in like the first 10 minutes. You yeah. Know, like we fresh turmeric, we'd have the fresh ginger there as well. And the ginger sold, it, it, it sold really well. We had a bit more of that than we did the turmeric. Um, so definitely no complaints there, but it was just, it was just amazing to us that, that people were just, yeah. you know, for their fire ciders, you know, it, it's fall. So you, you're starting to think about, you know, cold and flu season. And it's just, people were just, they, they, it, it was just amazing. So yeah, this, um, you know, th this past, I'm going to say early winter, you know, I'm thinking, well, okay, so it's really nice to get this free turmeric, but it's never guaranteed. Yeah. And some of the turmeric that we've tried to start, it has not come up for whatever reason. Um, yeah. Considering how well our sales were this past fall, I want a true dedicated supply of, of ginger and turmeric. Now I can purchase uh, ginger from the store and plant it. And I've had zero problem with, with all this, this fresh ginger coming directly, directly from wherever their distributor is. Yeah. Um, and it's, and it's relatively cheap. The turmeric on the other hand, that, that, that price has gone through the roof. So I started, um, I don't remember if I put a, a post on, on growing for market on, on Facebook yeah. or if I was just searching it. Um, but I found this farm down in Florida that they were advertising that they were selling fresh turmeric that they were digging. Um, and it could be then taken and replanted, you know, divided yeah. and, and replanted. And so, you know, I contacted them and we have relatives down in Florida and every, every December we, we go down there for our, our, our yearly vacation. Um, and so uh, the farm, uh, it was like, I think an hour or so from St. Augustine. It's like, shoot, that, yeah. that beats having it shipped up to Tennessee. So I, I, I contacted the farm. I was like, hey, we're coming on this date. Um, I got 30 pounds. He cut me a deal. He's like, if you buy 30 pounds, it's $5 a pound. It's like, yeah, I'm buying it. So I got it. I've got it in trays. Um, they're currently in, indoors because we, we still have some kind of coolish temperatures and I don't want the stuff to freeze uh, in our unheated high tunnels. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the story with our ginger and turmeric. You know, that's where we yeah. are now. So go back to the ginger that overwintered on you. I, I, I missed, did you grow that in a tunnel or was that outside? Okay. Uh, no, so far, all of our ginger and turmeric has been grown outdoors. Interesting. Um, and so even growing outdoors, the, the ginger came back the next year. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, we left, we left uh, a little bit of the ginger in the ground again this year. Uh, we did mulch the ground pretty heavily and we put agarbonds. Uh, we, ha we have some extra agarbonds where we kind of bunched it up, folded it up multiple times and laid yeah. it on the ground around the plants. Obviously, you know, the plant itself will die, the greenery. Yeah. Um, but the, the rhizomes and everything in the ground should live. And I'm hoping they'll live, especially with this extra protection that we've added to it. So yeah, we'll, we'll see this, this coming spring, if it comes back up, those tubers uh, should be quite massive. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's fascinating. Um, what would you say to someone who's thinking about getting into ag? You know, if, if you're thinking about getting into ag, you know, definitely do it. You know, it's, it's, it's a huge learning curve. It's going to be a huge amount of work, but it's so, so worth it. You know, I would say come in with a plan. You know, if, if you want to be a vegetable farmer, do your research in the area. Find out what farmer's markets are there. 
uh, find out, you know, are there other people with a CSA? You know, we, we've got a CSA uh, and it's, it, 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 it's been awesome, you know, with mm -hmm. all the connections we've been able to make in the community. Um, you know, are you a CSA farmer, a market farmer? Are you a truck farmer, a wholesaler? What are you? You know, what do you want to do? After you've done your research, you know, start small, but also diversify. Don't put all your eggs into tomatoes because, well, you, you could have disease problems or whatnot. Your tomato just yeah. like the dust. You know, so so diversify, do your research and get started, but also keep in mind the future. You know, you may diversify into into grains. You know, we never thought we'd grow grains when we first got this farm and started growing vegetables. You know, we never thought we'd do sorghum or, or ginger and turmeric. You know, my idea of being a farmer, a vegetable farmer was, you know, you've got your your tomatoes, your peppers, your cucumbers, your eggplant, there's your farm, you know? Mm -hmm. So always keep in mind open to what else you can, you can expand uh, onto and just diversify. Mm -hmm. uh, and if possible, some, some of the biggest things, you know, t go, if you, if you have a farmer's market uh, that actually has farmers that grow their food, make connections, make friends with them, follow them on Facebook, go to their farm, see their operations, you know, my friends that I've, I've mentioned a few times already, they're just down the road from us. I'm at their farm multiple times in a year, you know, whether mm. we're just having a good time socializing, whether we're actually out in the field and, and they come over to my farm as well. And I take them out to my fields and I'm showing them different things that I'm doing because I think you can read all you want to, you can watch a video, but if you can actually go out to somebody's farm and see the crop growing and seeing how they're growing it, they may yeah. not have it down pat, but it gives you an, a visual idea that you've actually seen something grown this way and it's possible to do it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Seth, thank you so much for your time today. It's been fascinating learning about your, your background, you know, how the crops you're growing and kind of all the, I, I guess I'd say your new things you're trying because uh, those are some very interesting crops, which I think a lot of people are thinking about, but they haven't experimented with yet. So it's great to hear your experience with that. Yeah, so certainly. thanks for joining us. Yeah, sure thing. Thank you so much for having me. I've really enjoyed it. Hey, Thriving Farmers. Have you checked us out on YouTube lately? We have a bunch of new content there, including a few rants by me. I uh, want to tell you, you don't want to miss them. Um, I actually go rant about you know some of the problems I see in our space and some of the challenges I see farmers uh, facing. So go check that out. We've got instructional videos over there as well. Talk about setting up our new farm here in Ohio and all the steps we're going to do that, as well as just tutorials and tips on best practices for all all sorts of things on the farm. So go ahead, check over at Growing Farmers on YouTube and see the new content we put together for you. So there you have it, another episode in the books. So I'd love if you would hop on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and a review. Those mean everything to us. We love to hear what you're thinking. If you have a podcast guest that you can recommend, please pop on over to the Thriving Farmer podcast website and leave us a review. That's thrivingfarmerpodcast.com.